And my name is Rosie Innes, so I'm the co-facilitator of this session. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, I'm the head of career planning and communication, uh, which is part of the career management section at UNHCR. Um, so welcome to this session. It's a very beautiful day here, the first in many days <laughs> here in, in Budapest. It's still cold, but at least the sun has come out, which is fantastic. Thank you, Rosie, and welcome. So the webinar today is going to focus on approaching the job market, and uh, we're going to go through a presentation to, to present you with data on the application process and offer advice and tips on how to set an application strategy so that your chances of being selected when applying for a job are increased. Uh, and with that, I would like to ask uh, Rosie to 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 go ahead and, and start with the with the presentation thank you marcia okay um so just to give a little bit of an overview of what we've been uh, looking at and what we'll be looking and uh, looking at in the future um uh, in the whole process around uh, job search uh, and finally achieving your your career objectives has a series of steps, um, and I think in the first uh, session last, uh, uh, I think more, more or less a month ago, uh, we were dealing with the first three steps, which is much more about self-assessment, uh, also exploring what's out there, and then on the basis of that, focusing. Um, this session will be focusing much more on setting your job search uh, strategy. Um, uh, and then the sessions, the future sessions, will be focusing more on what they call the marketing tools, so how to build an effective CV, how to write a, a good motivation letter or application letter, uh, and then finally you get down to, to applications. Um, the reason why I wanted to present this um, uh, framework is that what typically happens when people are looking for a job is that they go straight to the last step without going through this very important uh, first steps. Uh, and that's why often we're not as effective in job hunting as we could be. Um, so that there is this process around really understanding who you are, understanding what the market is looking for, uh, you know, taking decisions, and then really understanding how job hunting works, which is what this session today is going to be focusing on. Um, so here's the titles of the, of the sessions um, uh, that we've been uh, running and, and what we'll be uh, running, but just to give you, I, I guess, a framework of why we've organized the, the webinars in the order in which we've organized them. Uh, because we know what typically happens is that people, the first thing they do is that they already start sending CDs or they start writing their motivation letters uh, without really understanding what organizations are looking for or really understanding how people are hired. Um, so I guess to start with, um, they talk about job hunting. So here you have a picture of three very beautiful cheetahs um, and a few... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what are they, uh, bucks um, uh, uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, what qualities would you say good hunters have? And this is in the animal world, if you've ever looked at any documentaries uh, on how, how animals hunt, uh, what would you say, you can use the chat for this, uh, are, the, are, the, um, are the qualities that a good hunter has? What is it that they do? So you can write just suggestions in the chat and then Marcia will be reading them out. Exactly. So colleague, use the chat box uh, to respond to the questions. Um, so what do answers do? Uh, and we're getting already some of the first uh, uh, answers. So they spot their targets, uh, they're strategic, they, they're patient, they wait. Uh, they're also fast once they spot their targets. Uh, they know when to pounce. They're specific, they do their research, they wait for the target, they're organized, they focus. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think you already understood a, a few of the qualities, and yet when we're in job hunting mode, often we don't do this. We go straight for let's apply, 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 without actually really understanding what the, what the landscape looks like, what are the barriers, where are the opportunities, where is the easier prey? Uh, you know, where often a cheetah will, will look at all these um, uh, herd of animals and they're actually going to focus on which are the easiest ones to go for. Um, uh, uh, I think also hunters are very aware of who else is there. 
because there's a very typical uh, behavior in job hunting, which is we tend to have a, an idea that we're the only person that's actually hunting for a job. And we don't actually understand that often there's a lot of competition. There's, you know, here there's three cheaters. They're probably working as a team in this case, and there are actually job hunting clubs. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, often we behave in the whole job hunting process as if, as if we were the only person that's actually hunting for a job. And actually, you need to be aware of the fact that there is competition and we need to learn from what they might be doing, uh, which actually is better than what we're doing and, and will therefore put them in a better place uh, when it comes to being effective in the job, uh, in the job hunt. So what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, the first is to really understand how the job market works. Um, I'm going to be focusing this session very much on the external uh, job market, and not necessarily the UN system. I think the UN system has a, a very structured way in which it uh, 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 recruits uh, its people. Uh, but I want to focus um, uh, more on the, on the private sector, how people get jobs there, because I think some of the things that uh, happen there can be applied to the UN system in order to be more uh, effective. Uh, but above all, uh, I think nobody teaches us how to hunt for a job. Uh, generally, when we're launched out into the market after you graduate, you do what everybody else is doing. Nobody, nobody uh, uh, teaches you actually what is more effective, what is less effective. And that's why job hunting has such a, a reputation for being so difficult. Uh, uh, because often we're doing things, as I'll show you, that are actually not that effective. It might make us feel that we're actually doing things, but they're not always the most uh, effective things. So the first part of the presentation is going to focus on understanding the job market. Uh, you know, how, how do people get hired? Uh, and, and so on the basis of that, you can then define actually, okay, now I've understood what works better, what works less, uh, less well, so that can help you define your approach. And then finally, uh, execute. How do, we, how do you execute that uh, approach? So the first part of understanding the job market. Um, another question for you. Uh, when you think of your past job hunting experiences, what methods have you used in order to find these opportunities and, and, and finally getting them? Uh, you know, how, how did you find these jobs? Uh, and if you can again use the chat, let me know uh, what, what worked for you when it came to job hunting. Okay, so I'm getting already some of the first answers, Rosie. Uh, we have networking, we have web, web news, uh, papers, networking again, internet, sites like uh, Relief Web, for example, um, online searches, uh, speaking to people already in that organization, online search, social media, social network, job search websites, career websites, referrals, uh, friends advice, social networks, job websites, UN sites. So this is what mm -hmm. has come in so far. Yeah, I mean, people you know, use a whole array of, of, of ways in which they can find the opportunities and then, you know, what, what works. You know, typically people look at job boards that belong to organizations or if it's a private sector or a company. Uh, you know, what's quite typical is people start mailing out lots of CVs to different places and you have no idea where those are going to end up. Um, uh, answering ads in, in job sites, and this can be either general jo generic job sites or, or job sites, for example, uh, that are very focused, like uh, DevEx um, uh, or um, uh, Relief Web, etc., that we know are very focused on the humanitarian sectors. Um, uh, sometimes, and this is quite, it depends on each market, um, there are actually intermediaries, so it could be um, agencies or executive search firms or, or you know, this uh, so-called headhunters. Um, if, you're, if you're wanting to join the public sector, often that involves doing a civil service exam. And then as uh, people have mentioned, asking friends and family for leads, uh, using your network, your educational network. Uh, often if you've studied a master's in, I know, human rights, for example, professors are already connected with some of the organizations they might be talking about, and so they can be a useful, useful lead. Um, and then uh, I wanted to mention this idea of also temporary assignments, uh, uh, which can be internships, it can be temporary, you know, short-term contracts, but also consulting projects. Um, uh, I'll talk about those a little bit later on in the presentation, but these are a very useful way uh, in, in getting into organizations because it's essentially, I guess, a three-month interview. Uh, it, it enables you to get to know people inside the organization. It's pretty low risk compared to a full-time uh, position, and, and this can actually be a very useful way of actually finally getting the jobs that you're looking for. And then finally, you know, this idea of doing a personalized job hunt, which is to, for, for you to identify the organizations that you're, that you're looking to go into. 
uh, network with people in those organizations uh, in order to then uh, um, get a job that might not even be advertised, um, that's actually already brokered thanks to your networking. Uh, and so that's another way of, of, of finding jobs. Rosie, and Ruth here is also saying that profiling yourself with the market is very important to know what you lack and what is needed. For example, she's mentioning soft skills. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this first webinar that we ran in terms of understanding where you are, where you want to be, and really understanding where the gaps are is essential because without addressing those gaps, there's a lot of competition and there might be somebody next to you that has the same background as you have, but actually on top of that can prove that they have these very important soft skills that the organization is also uh, looking for. Um, so yeah, that process of you know first exploring, really understanding what the market needs, making sure that you address the gaps, and only then starting this process of job hunting is extremely uh, important. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the issue is, as I mentioned, nobody teaches us how to hunt for a job, um, and so you tend to do uh, what everybody else is doing, but we never really look, stand back and then actually start looking at, you know, what really works uh, uh, compared to other things. Uh, and I like this phrase very much, the most dangerous phrase in the language is that we've always done it this way. Uh, yes, but if, if, you know, we might have done it always this way, but is it really what works for you or not? So this is some, uh, the, you know, there's been a number of studies around how people get hired. Um, so I'll be showing some data uh, on that. Um, and I think what's very interesting about this graph, you'll see that on the lower um, uh, axis is how recruiters look for people uh, and how they prefer to look for people. And then on the axis, which is uh, the vertical axis, is how candidates tend to, to look for jobs. Uh, and I think what's very, very telling about this uh, graph is that actually generally uh, the, the, as job hunters, we tend to use things which are the opposite ways in which companies like to, you know, like to use as a source for recruiting people. Um, so if we look at the, 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 the most preferred method uh, for organizations when they're looking for people, I mean, clearly, you first start with your internal uh, um, uh, candidates. Uh, um, uh, why? Because you know them, uh, you also um, uh, uh, want to develop your people and you want to retain your people. Uh, so the first source for any organization always tends to be internal candidates. Uh, now what's interesting is that the, the method after this uh, is employee referrals, which means that it's the people that are working for your organization that are actually referring people saying, look, I've worked with with Mohammed in my previous uh, uh, assignment, the guy is really good, so we really need to hire this person in. Um, uh, and I'll show you why that's becoming more and more important a, a little bit later. Um, but it's it's this is initial trust. Um, you know, when you've got hundreds of CVs that you have to look at, it's very difficult to really know which of them uh, to choose from. So clearly, somebody that you know that you trust uh, that wants the best for your organization, recommending somebody. Uh, is, is a source that you would always have a lot more trust than just simply somebody that you don't know at all. Third, this idea of the consultant method, what they call the consultant method, but it can be an internship, it can be a short-term contract, uh, and it can be doing a project. Uh, um, uh, but why do organizations really like that? Because it's just a way of very tangibly testing whether you have the knowledge, whether you have the skills. Um, uh, uh, before actually taking a decision, uh, and it's a it's a much more it's a decision that's taken on a much more solid basis uh, than if you were just uh, interviewing somebody. Uh, because some people are very good at interviewing, but it is a risk of taking a decision which is so important for the organisation on the basis of a one-hour interview. Uh, whereas a consultant, the, you know, they have a deliverable, which is the deliverable, you know, the project, um, uh, and again, you you kind of interface with them so you can take a decision on a much more uh, solid basis. Now, only then do organizations uh, prefer to go to online applications. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily the first point of call, very important point of call, but it's not the first point of call necessarily. Uh, and now increasingly, and I'll be talking about this uh, in a bit, uh, organizations are really using social networks. This varies depending on what country you live in or what country you come from, but it, this is a trend that is going to be worldwide. Uh, um, uh, it's already happening in a lot of countries, uh, which is basically uh, organizations using the power of social networks to identify uh, candidates and to engage with them even outside a, a, a job process because they want to already have a relationship with them. So when an opportunity comes back, they can already say, look, would you be interested in? 
Um, uh, and then finally, you know, they will start advertising in third-party websites uh, like the ones that I mentioned, idea, um, uh, indeed.com or Monsters, etc., uh, and agencies. And, and why is it that this is a final thing? Because, of course, they have to pay for those adverts. Um, uh, and in terms of agencies or headhunters, uh, the, the cost is 30% of an annual salary. So it's a very, very expensive method and one that you tend to only do for very, very senior uh, managers um, uh, that you want probably for confidentiality also uh, uh, to have somebody external uh, looking for people for you, etc. But it, it tends to be a last uh, resort. Um, now, typically what happens in a lot of uh, uh, countries, uh, agencies, it depends on the job market of each country. In some countries, they don't exist at all. In others, they actually represent a big part of the market. Um, but um, uh, I think what's what's interesting about this uh, is that often, as a, as a candidate, you know, the first thing you do is to go on these online job boards. Uh, you you know you then you know want to go on the social networks. LinkedIn is really easy, uh, and all you need to do is click to apply to a position. Um, so you use all these methods, but they're not necessarily the most uh, effective uh, for you. Because sorry, fundamentally, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sorry. Just a sec. Yeah? Can you speak a bit slower? Just just a little bit slower, uh, so that because sometimes uh, people have uh, difficult connections and it sometimes it breaks up. So if you can just slow down the pace, it might help uh, with the connections. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. So just to I guess summarize this slide, I think what's really important is to understand that often the way that companies recruit uh, candidates uh, is in opposition to the way that we as job hunters look for a job. Uh, so you have to understand uh, that if employee referrals is a, is a very uh, preferred method by, by uh, companies to hire people, then you need to make sure that you meet people in the company or the organization you're wanting to join that can basically help you in that referral uh, in order to get the job. Uh, or often when you were looking for a job, you want, you want stability, you want a long-term contract, um, uh, but often it might not be the easiest way of getting a job because if companies, what they like to do is to test you on a short-term project, then it would it make sense for you to actually do one of these projects because it does give you the opportunity to show your skills, to get a network, etc. Um, I mean, because I, essentially when, we, when we're thinking about the job market, we tend to think that all jobs are advertised. Um, and there's varying figures around this. Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've throughout the years always heard different uh, figures in terms of, you know, how big the hidden, what they call the hidden job market is, versus, uh, versus the, the, the open uh, job market. Um, but the, at the very, very, very least, um, only 25%, I mean, that's the highest number I've ever heard, 25% of the market is open, which means the advertised market, that you can actually see these adverts on the job boards, you can see these adverts on a company website, uh, etc. And 80% of the transactions of how people actually get jobs is through the hidden market, uh, which is, you know, this referral system, uh, it's companies directly identifying candidates through social networks uh, or through their networks uh, generally. Uh, and so it's very important to understand that if your job search strategy is only going to focus on the advertised part of the market, you're actually missing out on this uh, 80%. Uh, and so essentially what's happening is that you have uh, you know, very few uh, jobs in comparison to the number of jobs of, you know, that people are being hired. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so you have a lot of candidates going for very uh, few jobs. Um, uh, so you have to have this um, uh, uh, taken into account. Now, the UN system, uh, by, by law, <laughs> has to publish all its positions. So it's, those are going to be advertised anyway. Um, uh, but the rest of the market um, doesn't have that obligation. Um, so a lot of people are brought into all these different kinds of uh, uh, companies and organizations outside uh, a, a position that is advertised. Uh, and if you really want to leverage the full market, you have to be very aware of the fact that a lot of it is hidden. Uh, and the way that people are getting jobs, uh, I'll, I'll talk about right now, uh, what, 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 what are those methods or what, how does that market uh, look like? Um, now, what's super important is to understand the impact of technology and the impact of social media uh, is having on this proportion 
of what is being advertised versus what is uh, the, the hidden job market. Um, uh, because thanks to thanks to social media, thanks to to technology, basically uh, the, the companies don't need to advertise because they can find the candidates very easily for themselves. Um, so understanding that social media now has to be part of the way that you that you find these opportunities and engage with employers, etc., uh, it has to be necessarily now part of your job search um, strategy. Um, and these are surveys that have taken place, uh, Europe, mainly the US, uh, but I've, I've seen very similar surveys from Brazil, from Mexico, for example. Um, so as I say, it might not be applicable to all countries yet, but it's something that is definitely coming. Um, uh, because what's happening is that organizations, uh, thanks to uh, social media, the fact that all these profiles are online, uh, can directly, you know, why advertise something if you can actually do a search on LinkedIn and find the candidates uh, um, uh, directly. Uh, and when they've started doing, and this is mainly uh, the, the people that were surveyed in this uh, survey were mainly large co corporates, um, uh, you know, 92% of them said that they will be using uh, social networks as a means for identifying candidates. Uh, and where do they look? The LinkedIn is the number one site, professional uh, site, but they're also using Facebook, they're also using Twitter. Uh, Google Plus. Um, so, so there are, you know, other uh, methods outside these that they're also looking uh, in order to find uh, candidates. Uh, and this is really, really important because our attitude as job hunters is still very old-fashioned compared to this very fundamental shift in the job market. Uh, and we have to shift with it um, uh, because that's the way that companies are hiring. Uh, so it's very important to be uh, aware of this. And and why is it that organisations and companies, and, and I'm talking about organizations because this is happening at UNHCR right now for certain positions as well, why they're using social media uh, uh, to identify candidates. Uh, well, A, because you don't have to pay for it, so you can, or you pay, uh, uh, in the case of LinkedIn, you know, premium recruiter, uh, but it, the, the cost is relatively, uh, well, it's very small compared to having to pay an agency to do the searches for you. Uh, so you can directly identify candidates, um, uh, uh, and so it saves the cost of using an agency to find them. Uh, and the thing is that now with LinkedIn, uh, for example, you can ha have 100% fit. Uh, in the past, maybe you put an advert in the local newspaper, you would get CVs, and maybe you would get candidates, uh, uh, you know, 80% fit, and so you had to compromise on the fact that the 20% wasn't there because maybe what you were asking for was, you know, a uh, uh, kind of wish list, if you like. Nowadays, thanks to technology, because there's so many more candidates there, uh, the likelihood that you're going to be able to find 100% fit is, is, is much higher. Um, uh, and then finally, also for, for very specific functions where there's actually a lack of people because it's either something very new. Uh, for example, in the private sector, digital marketing, there's not that many people that are experts in digital marketing. So all organizations are fighting uh, uh, for these uh, candidates. Uh, in the humanitarian sector, CBI or CRR, uh, these are new things uh, that require new expertise and there's not that many people that have an expertise. So all the UN agencies uh, are, are kind of uh, fighting, if you like, uh, for talent. Um, uh, and, and so what, what are they doing? Well, you know, you know that you might need these people in the future, so you engage with them, uh, you know, you send them things that might be of interest to them, that enables them to get to know, you know, what your organization. So you already have a relationship with them. So when you do actually have a job opening, you can already say, look, would you like to work with us? And because they know you and they've developed that relationship, it's more likely uh, that they will that they will attend. Um, Another reason why social networks are becoming so much more important is because it's been seen as also a very effective way of not only finding candidates, but actually finding candidates of the quality that you're, that you're looking for. Um, so you see here two separate um, uh, studies. Uh, in the case of one, as I mentioned, the employee referrals is, is proving to be a very effective way of finding uh, the candidates that you're looking for. Why? Because the people that your employees are recommending uh, have already, I guess, pre-screened people um, before recommending them. Uh, they know that you would fit with the organizational culture because they've worked with you, with you in the past. They know what your skills are and they know and they also understand the challenges of the organization. So they know that actually uh, you would fit into into that. Um, so referrals uh, are extremely becoming 
well, they've always been important, but they're becoming even more important now. Uh, and then after that, as you can see, social media, traditional job boards, these are all the different methods that uh, different organizations use in order to find you know, the, the highest quality uh, candidates. Um, uh, and you'll see in the graph on the right uh, that the number one is again referrals, uh, second is internal uh, moving of your people, and the third is direct sourcing, which means that now, thanks to technology, uh, you, I can go on LinkedIn, uh, look for people uh, directly, so I don't have to pay an agency to do that for me. I can actually find uh, people directly. Uh, and actually, a lot of the organizations that I spoke to uh, actually have people that, whose only role is to find these people. Uh, and they call them talent identifiers. Uh, you know, and all they do is spend all day on LinkedIn finding these people, engaging with them uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, directly source them into the organization. And before you paid an agency um, or a headhunter to do that. And on this, Rosie, there are there are two questions, uh, perhaps related uh, to to the topic now. One is the role of rosters, and the other one, how do people, how can people or recruiters hire through Facebook? What are the key elements? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in terms of um, uh, the first question uh, around the rosters. Basically, organizations are using rosters as a means of saving time uh, because the, the, the issue is that often you don't, especially in this changing world, you don't know uh, uh, when, when you're going to get an emergency, uh, when you're going to need people on hand. And so, so they create rosters because it's a very good way of basically pre-screening everybody. Once you're on the roster, they know that you're ready to hire. So it cuts down on this whole process of, of you know, vetting, screening, suitability, et cetera. And so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just a, a much easier way from the organization's point of view of having a talent which is ready on hand. Uh, and that's why those exist. Now, the frustration for the candidate of the roster is that you don't know when those needs are going to arise. And it could be tomorrow, it could be in a year uh, or in six months. Um, and so it's, it's um, I think it's, it's just an issue of understanding what the roster is for and, and, and managing your expectation uh, in terms of, you know, by all means, go for the rosters, be part of them. Uh, but in the meantime, while you don't get any news of, of, from the roster, keep on your job search as normal. Um, because if you're, if you're only relying on the fact that it's going to happen in the roster, you're relying on the fact that those emergencies are going to take place or those future needs are going to happen. So it's no guarantee, but it's, it's, uh, it's a useful thing in, in terms of it's a much easier way because all the vetting has taken place of getting on the ground a lot more quickly than waiting for this whole process. In, in our case, it takes two months to vet somebody, check their back, academic background, uh, you know, check, check their references, uh, etc. Um, so so uh, that, that's basically why they, why they exist. Uh, and the second question was on, can you remind me? Facebook and how, I mean, considering that on Facebook there is nothing related to education necessarily or, or professional experience, how can recruiters uh, use Facebook to, to recruit? That was the question. Um, let me just show you a slide. Uh, I'll do it. Uh, here it is. No, is it uh, in this one? Yeah. Uh, so how, how are um, um, recruiters using something like Facebook? I mean, here you see, uh, on the one hand, they're using Facebook to identify candidates. So they might do it through, for example, you belong to certain groups that have a special interest in something. So they're using it in that sense. But then they're also using it in terms of whatever information is available for screening. Um, now, mainly, what I, at least the recruiters that I spoke to, they tend to use LinkedIn because it has your professional background. I mean, it's no, it's it's not dissimilar to having a CV. Uh, and plus, you know, you can add things which are of interest to them in terms of really understanding what a what a candidate is. Um, uh, but this is actually a very important thing uh, of really understanding what is public to somebody uh, or not. Uh, I think people are becoming much more savvy about what is public or not. Uh, but it's extremely, extremely important because I have heard of recruiters um, uh, literally taking out somebody out of the process because they found pictures of them which are not appropriate to what the organization is looking for. Uh, and one might think, that's not fair, it's my private life, I can do whatever I want. Uh, but people do make judgment on these things. 
uh, or maybe the type of comments that you might have left publicly are not in tune with the corporate culture. Uh, might be, the, I mean, anything that you might have left, you know, very, um, uh, I guess, uh, in tune with maybe your friends and your values, but it might not be in tune with the values of the organization. Um, so it's, it's very, very important to really understand what digital footprint you have out there. And I would recommend just do a Google search with your name to see what comes up in terms of images, in terms of photos, and neutralize anything which would not be adequately uh, you know, valued by a recruiter. Um, so uh, here you have some figures around, you know, at which point do they, do they look at this? Uh, often, you know, it's just after receiving an application, uh, but maybe sometimes it's, you know, once they've had this first, uh, um, I guess, screening call, uh, they would might they, they would go in and see what more information is there, um, uh, uh, and uh, and this is something which is, I guess, relatively new for us. Uh, in, in the in the past, people would call up your references, and that would be it, um, but it's becoming. Uh, more and more uh, uh, frequent, and if we, as we've been seeing in the news, uh, you know, your data goes to a lot of places that you might not want it to go to. So you have to be very, very conscious of what you put up there uh, to make sure that it doesn't undermine you in any recruitment process that you're going through. Um, now, the other factor is this idea of referrals, um, uh, and I'm going to talk about this because this is extremely, as you saw, it's actually a, a very, very high source of, of way in which uh, people get jobs. Um, uh, you know, I, I was, when I started researching this, I thought, well, referrals, maybe it's 5%, you know, something like that, or 2% of people are hired for referrals, everybody else applies, they go through a process, etc. And I was really shocked, actually, in the interviews that I did with all recruiters, mainly in the healthcare uh, and the um, uh, IT sector as to how high it actually was. Um, uh, and as you can see here, and this is from 2014 because I've been here for two years, um, but I mean up to, I mean I, I worked with eight out of the ten top pharmaceutical companies in the world uh, and I was amazed, you know, up to 45% of people were being hired through this referral uh, system. Uh, and in, uh, in June 2014, I went to a conference in London with recruiters from all kinds of sectors. Uh, and there, Accenture is one of the largest uh, consulting firms in the world. 40%, uh, they stated 40% currently was there, um, uh, uh, that everybody was being brought in through referrals system. But, but their target was that 100% of people would be brought in through referrals. Uh, King.com, you know, Candy Crush, I'm sure everybody knows, 35% um, uh, and Uber that I'm sure a lot of you know as well was 35% of the time as well. So it is actually becoming much more more uh, important uh, and why it's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's this idea of trust, uh, you know, it's people you know um, uh, 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 basically telling you, you know, this is a really good person to hire because they have the right skills, etc. Um, uh, and, and what was very interesting in those conversations is that all the recruiters told me, look, a lot of organizations are moving to this idea, moving away from this idea that talent attraction is only the responsibility of HR and you have, you know, your talent outreach and acquisition uh, section, which is what we have here, and, it, and it's only up to them uh, to be responsible for hiring people in. Um, uh, now. So, so uh, it's becoming a much more global responsibility in, in, in organizations, and that's especially in, in functional areas or in roles which, where it's very difficult to find people. Um, so here at UNHCR, for example, finding uh, um, field safety and security people is, is difficult in the UN system generally. Again, the organizations are all fighting for this uh, talent, uh, and these, these people all belong to a network that they all know each other. Uh, so when you're looking to hire somebody in, the first thing that you do is to ask your FSS people and ask them, look, can you think of anybody that we could contact? Because we really are looking for people. Uh, and that's how, you know, people still go through the application process, but how they learn about these opportunities uh, is through that referral uh, system. Uh, and what's quite interesting is that because in certain areas, uh, the war for talent is what it is, uh, in order to encourage their employees to think about the people that are looking to attract, to even give them a bonus for successful candidates. Um, and in my research, I mean, this bonus went from, I'll show you now, this That's is the World Bank. Uh, so with the World Bank, uh, uh, was I think it's $400. Um, yeah, $400. Uh, but I mean, in the private sector, it could be 6,000 euros. Um, so it's not a small amount uh, of, of money for just simply suggesting somebody that would be good for your organization. 
Uh, now you get the bonus once the candidate is on board, they work, etc. It's not that uh, just by suggesting a, a name you're going to get a, a bonus. Um, uh, but why are they doing this? A, to encourage it, but also because um, it's a lot cheaper than, than getting a headhunter to do the same thing for you. Um, so, I mean, this is the old-fashioned example of referral, and this is a real example um, uh, of um, that I got in 2014. Uh, IFC is the private um, sector area of the of the World Bank, um, uh, and so basically, I, I received this email uh, from somebody that I knew. Can you think of anybody uh, that, that worked at the IFC? Can you think of anybody uh, and tell them to get in touch with me because I'll I'll, I'll suggest them, and then hopefully, I can get my $400. Um, so this is this is how how um, a, a lot of referral is working, and now thanks to technology, uh, a lot of this is happening online uh, through LinkedIn, for example. Um, so an organization will ask you permission to have access to your network, uh, and then the system will actually look for people in your network that fit, uh, and then you just get an email saying, "I see that there are three people in your network that fits the profile that we're looking for. Who would you refer?" Uh, and again, just for clicking, uh, you know, you, you get a bonus. Uh, Rosie, we have two so, questions on referrals yes. uh, specifically. Yes. Uh, Mariana is asking whether she should contact uh, the organization then prior to applying for a job, uh, whilst Farai is actually questioning whether uh, approaching an organization beforehand is this not actually canvassing and would that be frowned upon? So if you can clarify these two points, please. Um, so, in the, the answering the first question, Mariana's question, yes, absolutely. You need to develop these relationships before you even apply. Uh, and why is that important? Uh, because it sort of answers the second question. Um, I mean, basically, there's uh, IFC, uh, not IFC, UNHCR in the last year has received 30,000 applications. You know, how do you distinguish between them? Uh, you know, maybe out of, uh, for a specific position, we get maybe 200 uh, people applying. Maybe 50% of those don't fit at all the profile, but you still have to choose between, you know, 100 uh, for one position. Uh, so other than throwing these things up in the air and just catching one and saying, okay, this is the one, how, how do you, how, what, what else do you need to know about them in order to take a decision? So that's where the referral comes in. Um, uh, and this is uh, a, a canvassing. Uh, is that wrong? I don't think so. I think it's just uh, it shows motivation. Um, uh, and, and, and I think what, what is wrong is to hire the wrong person. Uh, you know, they don't have the profile, you're hiring them. But hiring the right person because they've been motivated and they've, uh, you know, shown what it takes, etc. I don't think, I don't personally see anything uh, uh, wrong with that. Now, I think what is really important is to develop these relationships before you even apply, because uh, if, you, if you try and do it at the same time, then yes, uh, it's much more uncomfortable. There's more of a conflict of interest. But if you've developed the relationship before, uh, and then when you apply, you just simply send an email, I'll show this later on, uh, saying, look, by the way, I've applied, it would be great if you could refer me. Uh, um, you know, that doesn't, that's not a problem at all. Um, and when I used to work uh, as an intermediary for the development sector, so it wasn't just humanitarian, I used to visit a lot of uh, uh, UN organizations and systematically I was told by recruiters, look, please ask uh, uh, um, the people, the students that are applying to the organization uh, to get a referral uh, because that really helps us in the selection. Uh, so, so I think it's something which is very, uh, as I say, the recruitment is always very rigorous in terms of we're not hiring somebody that doesn't fit the profile, uh, but if we can have some more information on that person, uh, then all the better. So I guess, you know, key message, it's, it's not only what you know. Uh, um, I mean, my father, I think when in the 1950s it would have been, he had a boss uh, that used to say it's not what you know, it's who you know, uh, and, and that hasn't changed today. Uh, you know, who you know really matters. Um, uh, and if you think about, I uh, saw so in the list of uh, methods for people finding uh, uh, jobs, uh, you know, people make the world go around. So it really is important that you build this uh, attitude of, of, of networking, of getting to know people uh, into your job search strategy so that you go beyond just simply sending out applications uh, because that, there's a lot of people doing that and that's not what necessarily uh, only works. So to conclude this part of the 
presentation. Uh, you know, basically, as you've seen, generally employers look for candidates in almost the opposite uh, way to the way that candidates look for a job. So, you know, understand what works, what doesn't work, uh, because that's going to help you determine what you do, what you do next. Uh, and above all, do it because your job search is, 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 is tough, it takes a lot of time, so why use that time on something that doesn't work? Uh, it might make you feel very, um, I guess, uh, comfort, uh, comforted that you're sending out all these hundreds of CVs, but if that doesn't work, um, then you know, ultimately it's a short-term comfort for something that doesn't really uh, prove to be very useful for you. So to the next part of the presentation, um, so on the basis of what we've spoken about, uh, you know, how do you define your, your approach then? Um, my guru in all of this is a guy called Daniel Porro, I and mean, you'll see that I'm going to mention him a little bit later on. Uh, and Daniel always talks about the Bermuda Triangle of job hunting. Um, I don't know if you know what the Bermuda Triangle is, but it's an, an, an area uh, off the coast of, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, off, off uh, Bermuda, as Bermuda Triangle is, uh, where very strange things happen. You know, boats disappear, apparently even planes have disappeared in the past, etc. cetera. Um, and, and uh, you know, what he says is if, if you just focus your um, uh, job search on sending out applications, um, uh, only using human resources, um, and in the case of countries, is where exact such uh, firms are, are important. If you just base it on that, it's going to be very, uh, I mean, you, you might be very lucky, but it's going to be, be much more difficult for you to, um, uh, to, 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 to find a job. Uh, and as he likes to say, uh, you know, a CV is a tool, it's not a job search strategy. Um, and I, I remember when he said it the first time, I thought, oh, you know, it's a very simple phrase, but hallelujah, that, absolutely. So if you're just relying on sending on these online applications, you're setting yourself up for a lot of competition and it's going to be much more difficult for it to be effective for you. You have to do something a bit more uh, or a bit more than that. Um, and the important thing to realize is, you know, who's really hiring? Um, and there's a bit of a contradiction when it comes to job hunting, because what we do is, you know, we think it's just human resources hiring, but human resources isn't hiring. They're just doing the filtering. Uh, you know, the ones that are hiring, it's, it's the hiring manager. So it could be a line manager in the case of the private sector or, um, you know, the head of operations uh, in the case of UNHCR. Um, so it's really important to understand what roles uh, each of these two different stakeholders have. Um, you know, human resources and a lot of companies or organizations, it's just pure administration. You know, they, all they're doing is, is, you know, they're paid to filter, so that's all they're doing. Um, uh, so they're not necessarily looking at the strategic side of talent uh, attraction, talent development, etc. Um, and you know, they tend to be pretty conservative. They're looking for proven experience. You either have it or you don't. Um, so they're not people that are going to take a leap of faith uh, on you uh, because they just need to justify why they've selected uh, that person. Uh, now against that, um, generally human resources, they're looking at somebody's career, not somebody's job. Um, so they're looking at, you know, uh, uh, pipelines, uh, workforce planning. Uh, so they're looking at uh, uh, a candidate from a very global perspective. Are they going to be able to develop a career in this organization? Um, uh, risk averse, and so they're looking for that proven experience. Uh, and they're very formal in the process. Um, I mean, you know, we're very, very structured. So they're going to decide on the basis of, of you know, a very set uh, process. Um, uh, and they're going to decide on the basis of a very set uh, process. Now, against that, you have the hiring manager who's ultimately the decision maker. So they're the ones that are going to say, look, I want this person rather than that person. Uh, and, and, yeah, these people are busy, you know, they, they're paid to decide uh, very, very quickly. They tend to be much more instinctive about uh, this is the person that I want, um, which is not always the most rigorous or correct way, but, uh, uh, you know, we have to recognize that that's the way it happens. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're, they're very, I guess, self-interested and in that they're looking for someone who can get the job done. Uh, you know, they're not interested about um, uh, talent uh, development. Uh, you know, all they're looking for is can that person do the job or not. Um, uh, now, you know, because they're, they're busy and they, they have to decide quickly, they tend to think a lot less. Um, so, you know, they're much more instinctive and, and much more likely to take a risk because they're much more likely to uh, evaluate the, the, I guess, the more abstract uh, um, uh, criteria in a candidate rather than purely does they have the four years protection experience or four years program or supply or whatever it is. 
you know, they're looking for somebody. Do they have the initiative? Do they have the drive? Uh, are they the, the, the relationship builder that I'm looking for, et cetera? Um, uh, and so, and they're less formal about the process um, in the sense that, you know, they tend to decide very much on those personal uh, uh, contacts, you know, uh, uh, above all in, a, in an interview. So you need to take account of these two uh, uh, profiles, yeah, because um, uh, some are, are viewing the world in a certain way um, uh, and others are, 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 you know, hiring in a completely different way. So you have to be very aware of these two, two audiences. Um, and in terms of how you manage the process itself, I think it's also, in, in, uh, as I mentioned, often as job hunters, we become very self-centered um, and that it's all about me and what I want and, and uh, how I want to be communicated with, etc. And uh, it's important to understand that actually the way that the expectations are viewed on, from these two points of view, the candidate on the one hand and the recruiter on the other, is, 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 is different. Uh, uh, and I say this just purely so that you, if you are in job hunting mode, that you that you manage your expectations so you don't get so frustrated. And I mean, I remember job hunting. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you're waiting for an answer and they don't tell you, and how frustrating that is. If you really understand how the process works, uh, you can kind of you know understand those expectations better, and therefore not get so frustrated. Uh, so for the candidate, you know, I'm just looking to get hired, uh, I want to be acknowledged, you know, the fact that I've applied, I want to be spoken with, etc. Um, you know, I want my, you know, my CV is there, uh, you know, why do I have to do anything else? You know, it's all in my CV, um, so we want the CV to say all, um, and, and we expect, you know, the employer to take the initiative to, I guess, woo us and, and enamor us, um, uh, and uh, and then apart from that, uh, we also want the employer to really give us a good understanding of, you know, what am I going to be doing, what's this organization, etc. Uh, and the recruiter's expectation is almost the opposite. Uh, so, you know, for them, the, pro the, the they're getting a whole lot of applications and their whole, the process is, look, how do I start whittling this down uh, to, to very few candidates? So, so for them, it's an elim elimination game. Um, uh, you know, they would love to acknowledge everybody, but they don't have the time. Uh, not when you're getting 200 applications. So, so uh, you know, they're just too busy to acknowledge every applicant. Um, and then looking at everything that you do as a candidate. So they're not only looking at your CV, of course, they're looking at your motivation letter, a CL would be cover letter. Um, but they're also, you know, seeing how you interact at every stage, you know, your calls, your, the tone of your emails, uh, even how you might negotiate your salary in, in, uh, in the private sector, there's always negotiation of your salary in the public sector, it's set. Um, uh, so that they're reviewing absolutely everything. Um, uh, and, and they're really expecting, you know, since I don't have the time, just, you know, remind me. So they expect the candidate to take the initiative. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, what they're really expecting is, is that the candidate should have to show motivation and that they've done your research, that you've really understood what this um, uh, uh, organization does, what does a position entail, uh, what, what it's like to work there. So they really do expect candidates to, to, to go the extra mile and really find out about them and what they do. Um, I always view different organizations like um, as if they were fortresses uh, and you know they feel that they're very very difficult to get into um, certainly the UN system is uh, because there are an awful lot of applicants and you know the walls seem to be very very high um, uh, and so how do you get up these walls in order to finally make it into the into the fortress um, and the way that we tend to behave as job hunters is, you know, as if we were some kind of army, you know, that uh, a position is published and we all line up and we all apply. Um, and and, uh, and that's fair enough, uh, but it's going to be very difficult for you to stand out if that's the only way that you do things. Uh, because essentially it becomes a numbers game. Yeah, you know, when there's so many people applying, uh, then you're going to have to apply to a lot of positions unless you're tremendously lucky uh, to be the one selected out of the 200 that have applied. Um, so, so it's it's um, important to understand. This is a fortress. You know, how am I going to get into that fortress? Uh, and if I behave like everybody else, is this going to be effective uh, for me? So, how do you get the door open? Um, you know, all castles have a drawbridge uh, that is, you know, reeled uh, uh, down. You know, how do you get them to open the door for you? 
um, well, the first is, you know, already being one of them because you've done a project with them, so they can recognize you. You know, you've either worked with them on a, as a UNV, um, I don't know, maybe you're seconded to one of the UN organizations, so, you know, essentially you might be contractually a UN volunteer, but actually, uh, you know, you've, you've got experience of that organization and therefore, you know, they consider you already one of them. The other one is we've already spoken about referrals. So if somebody needs to recommend, uh, you know, to tell the guys there at the gate, look, uh, pull the, the the door down because this guy is a good is a, is a good uh, good girl to have uh, to have with us. Um, another way, as I mentioned, is this idea of low risk entry. Um, so it's not going to be a big problem if you go in because actually what you're in for is is a short term project, uh, it's a consulting project, or it's an internship or a, or a, or a TA. Um, but, you know, it's just a way of intelligently getting your foot in the door and once you're in there, uh, people can get to know you, they can see what you work, the quality of your work, they can see the fact that you have the skills um, uh, uh, in order to do that, uh, in order to do that job. And finally, of course, the ideal thing is to be a scarce resource. Uh, and this is where, in terms of career management, we need to be uh, intelligent. You know, we need to anticipate what is it that organizations are looking for. Uh, that is a, that is scarce in the market. Um, so it can be uh, knowledge of a new technology because that hasn't been really rolled out generally. Uh, it can be uh, knowledge of a new methodology. Um, uh, so we need to, as, as candidates, a, a very good way of managing our careers and ensuring that this process of getting the door down is much easier uh, is to focus our careers not on the mainstream uh, knowledge necessarily, but on actually uh, always being at ahead of the curve in terms of what's happening with my functional area. Uh, and the ones that are kind of more lazy about this they're gonna, will always find it more difficult because the, the, the profile will always be more standard. Uh, and there are developments happening in every functional area all the time. Uh, and so so it's really, really important not to fall asleep, to really understand that actually, I don't know, the latest techniques in supply or uh, the latest in uh, uh, accounting practices, uh, you know, whatever is happening in your functional area, you can't afford not to be up to date with that because, you know, if you, if, if you know about it and it's scarce, the door will come down for, for sure. So I wanted to put a little video on. Um, uh, Marcia, I don't know if you could send the link to everybody. Uh, because if I put it on from here, nobody's going to hear it. Um, I will send the video and I will also launch it from here. I will try to launch it from here so that uh, hopefully this will work. Um, just give me a minute. Okay. So... Um, Okay. Just uh, sorry, yeah, my apologies. I have only one screen today, so I'm I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> Can you see the video? Uh, yes, but we can't hear it. Okay, just a minute. Um. What about now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, 
So I'm just going to give you back the screen. Uh, So Rosie, you should be able to see. You should be able to have your screen back. Okay. Now um, I will share also the the link with the colleagues because I think not everybody could hear very well. Okay. Yes, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to do that. I mean, it's a very short uh, video. Here it is. So I I share I shared it in the chat box. For everyone to see. So I'll just give you uh, yeah, a couple of minutes to look at the, the video. Okay, so I'll just put it on here. Oops. So, what can we learn from uh, Harvey? Um, shall we just use the, the text? You have these very cute little dogs uh, at the beginning. Um, and what is it that Harvey's doing that the other ones um, are not? Okay, so colleagues, um if uh, those of you who could watch the who could which watch the video uh, can you uh, please look at what what are what are the main elements that we learn from from the dogs we say right so we have uh, kiva who says marketing themselves showing other skills using technology import the importance of uh, selling yourself uh, the concept of from Chloe, I know what you need and I can do it. Um, marketing again, so marketing and selling themselves as assets. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first two little dogs that you see there, so you see a little sausage dog and you see a, a Labrador, they're beautiful dogs. I mean, they're very cute. Nobody can deny that they're absolutely lovely. Um, but what Harvey's done is to really anticipate needs. He's done his research. Um, you know, he, he's uh, kind of understood actually what would a couple need? Uh, they need somebody to cut the grass, they need somebody to go after the kids, pick them up from school, put them to bed, play chess with them. Uh, you know, so Harvey, what he's done above all is that he's actually really done his research to understand, uh, you know, how his, how his uh, um, presence in this family will be an asset, uh, you know, rather than just uh, I'm a dog. Um, and I love using this video because I think it's just a very good way of showing that actually often uh, the way that we present our candidacy is this is a regular applicant um, and, and all of you have amazing experience and you have skills that you can contribute with, but instead of presenting yourself as a, as a resource uh, uh, of those skills, etc., uh, you tend to just, I'm just submitting my application, I'm just going to be a regular um, uh, applicant. Uh, and this you need to do at every stage. Uh, you know, we were talking about developing relationships with the organization even before you apply. You're already doing it then. Uh, and then, of course, you have to do it very effectively. And that's what the sessions in the future will be focusing on in terms of your motivation letter, your interview, uh, uh, how you design your CV and your application, uh, etc. Um, but always keep in mind that you're a resource and that's what you have to think about. Okay, what is it that I'm going to contribute with um, and to have very clear in your mind uh, what those things are. Um, because essentially, you know, as I said, you're there to solve problems. Uh, and, you know, one thing is I'm an applicant, you know, see how I can fit in and, you know, how you can use my skills. Another thing is that you're actually presenting yourself as a, as a problem solver. And this is just, you know, I, I selected some generic um, uh, functions. I know some of you are working across different uh, uh, functions. But, you know, what, what would be uh, being a, a problem solver if you're working in supply chain? Uh, well, you're reducing the inventory, you're reducing the cost of uh, delivery. 
uh, you're reducing the cost of, supplier, uh, of suppliers um, uh, and a reduction of late deliveries, etc. And that's very different from just saying I'm a person with four years experience in supply. Um, uh, uh, in the case of finance, uh, you know, you're increasing cash flow, um, uh, you're increasing, uh, the, uh, I guess, rigor into the, the process of budgeting, uh, 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 reducing errors, etc. Um, so just think about when it comes to your profile and when you're approaching the job market, what problems specifically are you trying to solve? Uh, and present yourself as a candidate that is a, a, a problem solver, that is going to address the challenges of, of the positions that you're applying to. Um, and another factor, I would say generally in this process, is, is it's very important, the, the, the idea of showing motivation. Um, because what recruiters really hate, and I've, you know, I've probably interacted in my work life with at least 120 of them, uh, you know, they hate this idea that you're, that you're applying to them the same as you're applying to everybody else uh, and they know you're applying to more than their organization uh, but that said um, you know they want to know that you're actually motivated uh, uh, by the role that you're applying to uh, why um, because I mean uh, they've got statistics uh, motivated employees um, produce uh, uh, 20 20 percent or 21 percent more productive um, you know the, the people that are much more resilient work is always tough but because they're motivated they will overcome whatever barriers you're facing in the work that you do um, uh, if you're motivated, you identify with the organization uh, and, you know, there's fit, uh, cultural fit. Um, uh, organizations hate people leaving because it's very costly. You need to find somebody new. You need to train them. Uh, uh, and also, because people are motivated, there's going to be less of the type of behavior that, you know, organizations wouldn't want. And here I'm talking about, uh, you know, code of conduct issues. Um, uh, it could be issues around uh, corruption, uh, etc. So, so motivation is not just something that oh, you know, we want motivated people. There's a very tangible reason why organisations uh, want motivation. Uh, and then on the other hand, of course, for you, I mean, job hunting is a chore. So you, you, I mean, the, uh, uh, the being motivated is extremely important in this uh, job hunting process uh, because, um, as I say, you need the energy to drive you forward. Uh, it's definitely what um, separates uh, a candidate um, uh, average from standing out. Um, uh, and, you know, if you're not convinced that that's a position that you want, how are you going to convince anybody else? Um, so, so really important, those two factors of presenting yourself as a resource and, on the other hand, also presenting your, your motivation. So to conclude this part, um, uh, you know, understanding what HR and the hiring managers uh, expect from you will, will just make your job search a lot more efficient, also more effective. Um, uh, also understanding how that process works from the point of view of the organization will just help you understand, uh, you know, adjust your expectations and therefore make the whole process a lot less stressful. Um, you know, think about how you can get that door down. Um, that if you behave like the army, all attacking the wall at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's a process, but it might not be the most uh, effective process for you. So just think about, you know, what methods can you use to get that back door uh, open for yourself? Uh, and then above all, when you're actually already in the process of application, uh, you need to, to, to position yourself as a, as a motivated problem solver rather than I'm just applying for a job, which is what a lot of people uh, do. Now, in terms of execution, so we'll just get back to the, just the last part of the presentation. Um, I think what is really important is, uh, depending on where you are and where you want to be, you're going to have to be more proactive or you can afford to be, I don't think you can ever afford to be passive, but you can afford to be a little bit less proactive. Um, uh, because the less you fit, uh, the more proactive you're going to have to be, because if you rely on the application process, it's going to be very, very unlikely you'll ever be selected. Uh, because on paper, you will never be as valid as the candidate that has the profile. Uh, so you need to find other ways in which you make an impression with the manager, with the decision maker, uh, in order to make sure that you're that you're uh, the person that's selected. So as I as I mentioned, you know, there's this different different uh, attitude in your approach. One thing is just to be an applicant. Another thing is that you're that you're more this consultant mindset. I'm here to resolve your challenges. I'm a problem solver. Um, uh, so, so have this in mind when it comes to executing your, your strategy. Um, and I mean, there's no, there's no more tangible way of showing your motivation.
motivation than, than, than being proactive. Uh, you know, doing your research well, connecting with the right people. Uh, you know, it's a very tangible way of showing that you really want that job and that you're interested in it because you're going the extra mile compared to just simply submitting an application. Um, now, I want to talk about, I don't like the word networking because it has a lot of very negative uh, connotations. I much prefer to call it relationship development. Uh, you know, we as human beings are connecting beings. Uh, we like to develop relationships, um, uh, and uh, you know, relationships are for the benefit of both. Uh, it's not something which is transactional, and it's only uh, you know you only do it because you want something out of them. It's because you have something to give, and they have something to give you. Um, uh, now, an effective way to uh, um, sorry, uh, an effective way to uh, uh, effective relationship development. Uh, I mean, all it is 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 uh, just make, making sure that you develop uh, relationships with the people that you meet. Uh, you know that um, everybody that you meet in the work that you do, not only in your own uh, department or section or unit, whatever the expression is, wherever you are, um, uh, but also in the different areas of the organisations that you work for, in the conferences that you might attend, uh, in the meetings, interagency meetings, uh, meetings with partners, um, uh, with uh, with uh, stakeholders. Etc. Uh, all of those are opportunities for, for, for you to develop relationships, which are not only enriching, uh, but they also are a very good source of, of information and potentially opportunities. Because as you've seen, we're moving towards a world in which referral really becomes very very important. Um, and you know, so who is your network? It's it's um, you know everybody uh, that you you know that you might know uh, that uh, that may be able to support you in reaching a specific uh, goal. Um, now, for me, the goal is always um, developing a relationship rather than an end uh, in itself. Uh, but I think it's just important to understand um, uh, that you know this network uh, is actually very, very useful uh, in this whole process of, of, of job hunting. Um, now, I mentioned Daniel, uh, my guru in all of this, um, and Daniel all, all often talks about uh, the pie method, um, uh, and he says, you know, above all, developing relationships, you should do it for pleasure. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you do it because you like people, uh, you enjoy uh, what they, what they, how they enrich you. Um, uh, so, you know, above all, do it for pleasure. Um, then, as we saw in the first session, do it for information, because without information, it's going to be very difficult for you to decide where to go or understand where those opportunities are or how to position yourself. Uh, and then finally, of course, it's a very useful way of, of networking for, for employment. Um, you know, people tend to think of networking only for the E, and, and no, not at all. I think there's these two other very, very important uh, elements um, that if you do those first two really well, the, set, the third one looks after itself. Um, and why, why develop relationships? Um, uh, it's very interesting. This book was published in 1973. It's called The Strength of Weak Ties. Um, and what's very, very interesting is that we tend to think that those close to us are going to be the best source of uh, information about opportunities. Um, uh, and actually, this study proved that it's actually the weaker contacts that can often be much more useful. Uh, why? Because you know people in your network uh, know the same as you do, so they won't necessarily uh, give you fresh information or ideas because they tend you know, people that you know close to you. Uh, uh, we tend to gravitate towards people that do the same things as we do, uh, have the same interests, etc. And therefore, the likelihood that they know what you know is quite high. Um, so, so by all means, don't just stick to the people that you know best. Um, on the contrary. Uh, you know, have lunch with the person that's working in a different uh, uh, agency or department because actually they might give you ideas uh, that your close network uh, won't be able to give you. Um, we have the slide in the, in the last presentation as well, but I mean, I think we need to go through this exercise of actually really sitting down and thinking, okay, who do I know? Um, because we, of course, we know our friends, <laughs> hopefully, um, uh, but actually, in our whole life, we have interacted with millions of people uh, in our work, uh, as I mentioned, in, in uh, different conferences and uh, workshops uh, at university, etc. And actually, you probably know a lot more people than you think, you know. So, so going through this exercise of really doing an audit of, of you know, who, who, who do I need to reconnect with can be very uh, useful. Um, and in the end, it's just a matter of, you know, I'm not saying follow this at all, it's just, um, uh, you know, just 
try to anchor the people that you know based on where you want to go because in the end this whole process of developing relationships etc takes a lot of time uh, and you can't do this with everybody so it's just a good idea to sort of focus on the people that you're most uh, you know likely um, uh, to be able to contribute to and they contribute uh, uh, back um, uh, but be systematic about it uh, is, is uh, the point that once you have a matrix of, uh, you know, I want to work in finance uh, in these different uh, uh, sectors, um, uh, then I'll, I'm going to put the name next to the people that actually work in those sectors in that function because these are the people that I need to start, you know, getting information from, developing a relationship with, etc. Now, a question for you. Um, what do you think that, you know, when you contact somebody, you know, what could they possibly feel? And again, just use the chat. You know, what are the different emotions that might be going through their head <laughs> when you contact them? So please use the chat box to reply. So uh, when you're uh, looking at your contacts and you contact them, what, what do you think people may feel? So some, uh, some um, colleagues are replying excited and uh, quite the opposite of that, harassed. Uh, some colleagues are saying that the contacts were happening to hear from, from her because of the previous engagements. Uh, they also say things like, what does he want now? Um, others are asking, uh, perhaps annoyance that he that is something what they fear that you know there is no respondents or annoyance on the other side um, excitement and interest to help um, Eloise also is mentioning this dual this dichotomy no they can be flatter, flattered or annoyed it depends on the contact uh, um, yeah and some others yeah, would I mean, like to have a more specific question, you know, so that they can respond more, more, more clearly. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I mean, there's lots of emotions that can go through a person's head when they receive an email from somebody saying, oh, you know, I'd like to reconnect with you. Um, you know, one is confused, you know, what, 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 what on earth do they want? <laughs> um, some of them might think, oh my God, um, you know, am I going to have to take on board the responsibility for their future job, their life, their existence? Uh, some might be in a very stressful time and they think, oof, I'm not going to answer this because, you know, I just really don't have the time to address somebody else's life, uh, never mind mine. Uh, some might think, actually, you know, what's in it for me? Uh, you know, is it interesting for me to reconnect because it actually might be interesting for, for me? Uh, others, as you know, some people said, you know, they might be worried or even angry. Um, uh, you know, they also think it's actually, uh, is this uh, canvassing unfairly? Uh, maybe it's inappropriate. This is kind of not fair for for a, you know for a fair process. Uh, others might feel extremely flattered or curious. Um, uh, I think it's it's a good idea to do this exercise of you know how people might feel because it might then help you understand how to communicate uh, uh, with the people when you first contact them. Um, and. Why am I saying this? Because I think when you start contacting people for employment, uh, I think the ideal thing uh, is to contact decision makers, um, but without any agenda uh, behind that. Because what you're trying to really do is to have a kind of what I would call a business or operational conversation. So it's not an interview. It's very much trying to get an understanding of, you know, uh, uh, what are your challenges? Um, uh, because then you, you already start developing a relationship with it. It's an equal standing. You know, you're not asking for favors, you're not begging for a job. Uh, all you're doing is basically having a, a conversation about what they do, uh, what challenges they have, because that then gives you an entry to show how much you also know about those challenges uh, and what you've done in the past to address them. And it's a much more subtle way of developing a relationship for what you want, which is for employment, than saying, contacting somebody saying, I'm looking for a job, please help me. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, we do this very naturally uh, uh, in, in our daily jobs. Um, you know, before getting down and deciding on anything, the first thing you do with your, inter, you know, the other counterpart is to try and understand, you know, what's their position, uh, you know, how can we reach an agreement together. So it's no different in that process. Don't be embarrassed by it, because basically what you're trying to, to get an understanding uh, is, is really of, you know, what's keeping them awake at night, um, because then you understand uh, how it is that you can help them in whatever challenge uh, they have. 
Uh, and so the, 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 there are two key recommendations in this. Uh, the first is that when you're doing this, the f uh, is you, le you need to learn how to manage information. Uh, you know, I've seen emails of, of people that are, you know, almost like a chapter of a book where they're explaining their whole life story when they're trying to contact somebody, they include their CV, they, you know, their whole background, etc. And And that's I mean, if you want to really get somebody's fear up, um, uh, that's what you that's what you uh, what you do, uh, because suddenly they think, oh my God, you know, they're asking me to get them a job. I don't even know them from anything. Uh, so you need to manage information in a way in which you start developing relationship first, ultimately for getting what you want down the li down the line. Uh, so ask for advice, not for a job. Uh, this is a number one recommendation. Never ask for a job directly. You know they, they don't know you from Adam, so why on earth should they give you so should they give you a job? This is a matter of getting the information that you need so you can have a business conversation and then just see how you can work together. And as I say, it's something that we do very very naturally in our daily work, but for some reason we don't tend to do it when it comes to job uh, to job hunting. There is a question so from uh, sorry. Yeah. There is a, a question from ER and asking if whether it is a good sign when somebody from let's say from a company, a recruiting company, or from the hiring committee encourages you to apply writing privately without having met before. So it's asking whether this is a good sign um, and how to interpret it. Yeah, I mean, it is a good sign in the sense that they've, they've pre-identified your, your uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't contact you and ask you to apply if they didn't think that your profile was interesting. Um, so, you know, as they say in Spanish, you know, el terreno lo tienes ganado, no? It's, there's that first part of filtering your, your profile uh, that has already been done. And so what they need you is to go, all application processes need to go through a, through a process. So they need you to go through the process in order to, I mean, it doesn't guarantee you a job. It just means that they, 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 they've looked at your profile they find it interesting and therefore they would like you to be an applicant. Um, so it is, I, I would say it is a good sign, yes, because they would never do that unless they didn't think that your the candidacy was attractive. Now, if they're doing it with you, they might be doing it with other people as well. So you're not going to be the only candidate because you know in the whole process they lose candidates because maybe they're at th that point they're only exploring, they're not really certain that they want to move jobs. Uh, or they've just accepted another job and they don't want to, you know, uh, go through a process again. Um, so, you know, it won't be, you won't be the only person they're contacting for sure. But yes, I would say it's a good sign because that part of the screening has already been done. Um, so, key recommendations when you're contacting people, keep it really short. Uh, you know, nowadays we all look at uh, emails through our mobile phone. Uh, so anything which is too long is uh, kind of deleted <laughs> uh, or kept for much later. Um, uh, so, so really important that you keep it really short. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, ask for advice on a job. Um, Steve Dalton is is a guy that wrote a book called The Two Hour Job Search, um, and then he 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 proposes this framework of his five point email. Uh, which he says 100, I think it's probably a little bit too low, I would say 120 words or less, no mention of jobs, is subject or body. Uh, uh, if, if it's somebody that's referring you, you know, I'm contacting you because you've got some uh, connection in common, you know, your, your um, uh, friend or your supervisor or your colleague has said, oh, you know, you should get in touch with that guy because, you know, uh, he, this is what he works in and so it would be interesting for you to contact them. Mention the connection first because that's clearly what's going to really hook them, uh, uh, and keep your your interest very general um, because the more specific you make it, the more you close doors. Um, so if you just keep it kind of generic, uh, again, this is relationship building. So it's it's if you keep it generic, it's less um, I guess threatening if you like. Um, uh, it's less easy for them to say, oh, no, actually, I don't I don't work in that, so I have nothing to say. Um, uh, uh, and then maintain control of the follow-up. And let me give you an example. So, Rosie, some questions are coming in about how do you follow up? after being in touch. So if you read now the, the example, uh, this is the first contact, and then what, what, do you, what are the next steps? Okay. So, you know, hopefully, because this is not a, you know, 20 minutes, of course I'll, uh, uh, I mean, the, the number of clients that I've done this with, and they say, oh, it was amazing, because we ended up having a conversation for an hour and a half, 
um, uh, it, it's been extraordinary. So, but you know, 20 minutes feels manageable. Uh, then when you start chatting to somebody because you love what you do and you love talking about what you do, etc., it becomes much more than 20 minutes. Uh, but it's just a very, it's just a way of addressing all those emotions and fears that we spoke about. Um, that it's just, look, this is just a first point of contact. I'm not putting any pressure on you. Then I would really love to get your advice. And, and people feel great giving advice. So, so it's just a very good way of starting that conversation. So what happens during the conversation? Then I'll talk about the follow-up. Um, now, this is a conversation about them, not about you. And the thing is, you know, we often make that mistake because we're job hunting. We're like, look, I need a job. Uh, this is what I can do. Um, no, focus it on them because then that gives you the window to then talk about yourself. So it's a slightly different way of, of going about it. Um, so, so ask questions about their challenges, you know, what they're working on, how that's developing, where do they see that going. Uh, so ask questions you know, around what they're doing. Um, and one thing that Daniel really recommends is, is to ask questions that you already know the answer to because you've done your research. Uh, I'll give you an example of that now. Um, but it's a very intelligent way of, of going about things. Uh, you know, if you know that they have a particular challenge that you have actually worked on in the past, uh, then ask them, you know, about that challenge because then it can it gives you uh, the opportunity to say, oh, they're not super interesting because actually when I was in, I don't know, uh, in Zimbabwe, we had exactly the same problem. And actually, you know, what we did about it was X, Y, and Z. And without, you know, it, 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 in a very natural way, you're actually talking about what you do and what you can offer. Uh, again, you know, you're not a job beggar, you're a resource. Um, uh, so if you if you really focus a conversation on them and what challenges you you they have, then it gives you the opportunity to show how you can be a, 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 a resource uh, for those challenges. Uh, and then finally, if it's a nice conversation, it was awesome. Look, you know, I'm really doing my, my research. You know, is there anybody else that I can also, uh, 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 would you recommend that I talk to? Because the more information I have, the more I'm able to then, you know, take decisions, uh, et, et cetera. Um, because every networking, relationship building opportunity is also an opportunity to expand the network and and you know people that like helping people will say yeah sure you know actually I know three people that are working what I'm doing right now I really do think that you should contact them uh, so so it's it's every opportunity of interaction is also you know is, it, uh, is, is there anybody else that you would recommend that actually it might be a good idea for me to talk to and they'll say yeah actually you know for that particular area in which this um, uh, function is developing in, you know, I know this friend that's actually working in that, and I think it'd be really useful for you to talk to them. Um, now, Steve classifies, um, uh, this is Steve Data we're talking about, he classifies people uh, into, you know, different types of people's uh, attitude to, to networking. Uh, and, and he, um, the, the first category, he says, uh, he calls them curmudgeons. Um, you know, these are people that he says, you know, would kick a baby in the street or step on a dog. Uh, you know, they're just not very nice people and they're never going to help you. Uh, and, and so that's the way, unfortunately, the world is. You do have these people. Uh, then he, he has a second group of people that he calls um, the obligates. The, and, and he says these people are a bit dangerous because, you know, they, they give the impression that they want to help and they, they're there for you, but actually bottom line is that they do nothing for you. And, and, and um, so, again, you know, and, and, and it might not be a personal thing. It might be they're just too busy. Uh, they've got other things to do. Uh, it's a busy time for them, etc. cetera. No? But, they, but they, they, they kind of promise things without necessarily delivering. And then the third category, he calls them boosters. And these are people, and there's a lot of studies around this, eh? uh, of, of people that just love people and are instantly connecting people all the time. Uh, I, have, I have at least three friends that are like this. And, and anything that you mention, you know, I've got a stain on my shirt, they'll recommend the, the dry cleaner you have to go to. Or, you know, I've had a problem with skin on my arm, uh, they, they know the dermatologist, and the next day you already have an email saying, okay, this is the guy that you need to contact to get that seen to. And they do it in a very natural way, you know, they're just, they, they like doing it, they love helping people uh, and their connectors. Uh, now, unfortunately, when we start on this process, we never know who's a Kamajan, we don't know who's an obligate, and we don't know who's a, a booster. Uh, so, you know, when you embark on this process, not everybody's going to say, yeah, sure, I'll help you. Uh, but unless you do it, uh, you're not going to get to the booster. So, so uh, just have that, uh, that, that in mind. Okay, so the boosters would definitely always recommend somebody to talk to because they love connecting people and they realize they're not doing it for you, they're also doing it for the other person because they think you're a great resource and you've got great experience. And wow, if I connect those two, two people, then it's going to be a benefit to, to both of them. So it's something that they do very, very naturally. 
So I mentioned about this idea that when you're in the conversation, you, you, you ask questions that you already know the, the answer to. I mean, if you've done your research here, it's you. Uh, you know, organizations uh, working in this area generally have had, a, for example, a challenge working with uh, uh, local authorities. Has this been your experience? And they'll, and they'll say, yeah, you can't imagine what happened to me. You know, this is this terrible, this paper, what we have to do and all these steps, you know, I just can't believe it. And you say, oh, yeah, it's super interesting because actually in my previous assignment, we had exactly the same problem. And what we did uh, was X, Y, and Z. So it's a way of making an impression without saying, I'm a great negotiator, I'm a great uh, broker or relationship builder or whatever. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a... Uh, a, a, a way of, of uh, selling your skills without necessarily showing that you're, that you're doing it because you're having this conversation of equals. It's not, you know, uh, please give me a job. Uh, uh, it's much more, tell me about what's, what's happening in your thing and then I can tell you how I can contribute with it. Um, and why is this important? Um, because, you know, if you think about it, um, I, I, I just did little screens of, you know, different CVs. Um, uh, and what people remember will always be the faces. Um, you know, they'll all remember, oh, that guy. I might not remember their name, but I remember, uh, and there'll be very particular things that they remember about you. So creating that, that personal impression is really, really important because when it comes to having those CDs on your desk, you know, they'll see Thomas and they'll go, oh yeah, Thomas, you know, we had a really cool conversation about what's happening. And, uh, and so it's much more likely that they'll just pick out that CD and say, look, this is a guy that goes for an interview. Uh, or, you know, Maria, you know, we had this amazing uh, uh, conversation about this. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important to understand what people remember and that you create that impression. And so you're still going through the application process. I'm not saying that this is all purely, I'm going to talk to people and that's how I'm going to get a job. You still have to go through the application process. But what gets you selected is this other element of, of developing relationships. So somebody was asking about follow-up. Um, I think what's really important, and, and we're losing this, unfortunately, in today's world, is basically thanking, thanking people. Um, uh, and so, I mean, you have to thank them the moment you've had the Skype call, the meeting, uh, etc. So when you get home, you can just send them a nice email saying, look, thank you so much for the time that you spent with me. You know, what I learned uh, was what I found, or what I found very interesting about our conversation was X, Y, and Z. You know, this has been very useful in helping this process of exploration. You know, I'll keep in touch uh, to let you know how I'm getting on. That's it. Um, uh, now, in some cases, because the, the, the relationship has already kicked off on a good start, um, you know, from time to time, people do send follow-up emails saying, well, oh, just to let you know, I'm still on this search, I've been, uh, uh, and especially if they've recommended other people for you to talk to, tell them. Uh, there's nothing more uh, frustrating than, than, you know, you're connecting people and then you don't hear anything at all. You know, you want to know how it went. Was it useful for them? Uh, yes or no? Um, uh, so, so how do you keep that relationship kindled? Uh, maybe you see an article on the, I don't know, latest techniques that you were talking about in your functional area, send it to them. Uh, send it like, hey, look, I saw this, uh, when we, uh, and it was what we talked about, I thought you might find it interesting. Uh, so just keep it, you know, it's, it's uh, you're giving as well as, uh, you know, for hoping that you're going to receive something. Um, and then when it comes to applications, uh, uh, then just remind them, saying, look, you know, your advice was really useful, and actually I've seen this position that I've applied to. Uh, uh, you know, it would be great if you could provide a, a, a referral uh, to HR, and then that's it. Um, so, as I, as, you know, it's very difficult to ask for this if you haven't developed the relationship. But if you have, uh, it's going to be much, uh, much easier for you. Um, so, so um, you know, this is, I guess, the methodology that I'm recommending when it comes to approaching the, the, the job market. So, conclusions. Uh, you know, do overcome this uh, Bermuda Triangle. I think we, as, as applicants uh, or as job hunters, we tend to just focus on, I'm just going to send applications, hopefully one of them, you know, will come to fruition. Um, uh, so, you know, overcome that, that habit by, you know, targeting the hiring managers first and then, of course, do the applications, but, uh, but do it later. Um, also, another way is, okay, it's going to be difficult for me to get my foot in the door. Let's see if I can do it in a low-risk uh, um, uh, kind of way, uh, which would do, be actually a temporary uh, issue or doing a consulting project uh, for them that would enable them to, to really get to know me. Um, uh, and then finally, I would say if you're looking to kind of change careers, um, 
if you're trying to get into these fortresses, uh, it's going to be much more difficult, especially if there's a lot of applicants um, for, for your candidacy to be really considered at the same level as somebody that has a profile and has been doing that for the last four years. Um, so if you really want to get into that organization, get in on what you were doing before, uh, and then once you're in, move sideways. Uh, but don't try and do the two things at the same time because it's going to be much more, much more difficult. So that's the end of the presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Rosie. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this was incredibly informative. There are a few uh, elements that I, I picked up along the chat that we did not quite respond to it yet, uh, two of which are specific to actually the UMB uh, UMB uh, experience and to the UMB UNHCR experience. Um, so the question were in particular um, about how if uh, somebody uh, who's a UMB will automatically be included in a UN roster, and this I can already answer that the answer is no. Uh, um, what the U UMB experience does is to give you uh, some entry points and to give you the experience to work within uh, within the a particular agencies or a particular sector and in the UN system. So it gives you an understanding of how, how the system works and, and what the roles are, the functions are, but to be able to be included in rosters of the various agencies, you need to apply and you need to uh, follow the procedures that follows. The second question was more related to the UMB UNHCR uh, experience, um, asking how, when the if UN volunteers are considered then for UNHCR uh, in 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 various roles, um, and I do have an answer, which is the the fact that UNHCR does consider affiliate workforce where the UN volunteers fit in. So UN volunteers are considered affiliate, affiliate workforce for UNHCR. And after four years, and here, Rosie, please correct me, uh, they are uh, given uh, a, an additional chance to be considered as internal candidates. And perhaps, Rosie, can, you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, what we need to distinguish between uh, UNVs and IUNVs, uh, because we, we have uh, both types. In the case of uh, uh, international uh, uh, UNVs, uh, the policy changed last summer and it was revised in November uh, uh, positively in the sense that in the past it was four years uh, uh, as an IUNV before you had uh, this um, internal applicant status. Uh, now it's just three years. Um, uh, so you know, the, the, the policy, the, the objective of the policy was not only to um, uh, uh, bring in more national staff into the international professional category, but it was also, um, I think we, we in the past have had these two distinguishing staff types. So, so you have UNHCR staff and then you fill it workforce. Uh, for us now, everybody's workforce. So it's, it's uh, I think, a positive uh, move in the right direction. The people that have UNHCR experience, regardless of the type of contract, it's UNHCR experience, and this is what we value, and this is what we want to bring in and, and nurture in, in the organization, rather than having to bring somebody which is purely external to get used to the new, the new uh, systems, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I guess to answer the question, uh, it's that, that there is a distinction. Uh, I said uh, local UNVs don't have this uh, um, uh, a possibility, what they can do, because the UNHCR experience is, is um, uh, valued, uh, but they need to apply as external candidates. Uh, now, because the application process enables you to actually uh, put, do you have UNHCR experience, yes or no, those are the candidates that, of course, are going to be looked at first before somebody that is purely external and has absolutely no uh, exposure to UNHCR. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I think also uh, some of the elements that came up quite clearly uh, from, from your presentation, particularly in the initial part on how do we uh, get the organization to get to know us a little better, well, the UMB experience is really uh, a good way to showcase that you can do uh, the work, that you have the right expertise, Absolutely. that you have the right attitude. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is probably one of the means uh, to be able to achieve um, a career within, for example, a UN organization through the UMV uh, assignment, if that's what you want to do, if this is your career progression. There are a number of other questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of them and then uh, perhaps I'll give you the, the chance to answer. So. Um, 
Lillian is, ask, Lillian is asking, what do you do if your position is not advertised during your third year search to become an internal candidate? Um, I think probably this was already answered, Lillian, uh, in terms of uh, if, if you manage to do the, the three years uh, as UNHCR, then as an international UN volunteer, then automatically you're in. Uh, if not, then you need to apply as an external candidate. Uh, while Stephen is asking about uh, the actually a recently advertised UNHCR HR officer roster, um, and he's saying when is it possible that the roster uh, is drawn? So I assume when people will be called from the roster. I think that's the question. And the last question is how does UNHCR regard the online career fairs uh, like GCF? as a source for selecting candidate persons who are already applied to the talent pool. Mm -hmm. And then I have some okay. more, but I don't know if, if, if you need me to repeat anything. Uh, sorry, I was reading, so I wasn't very clear, perhaps. Just mm -hmm. let me know and I will try and, and, and rephrase. Okay, just uh, one thing that I want to mention, just to clarify, uh, after three years, it's not automatic. Okay? Uh, so basically, after three years, you're eligible to become, uh, uh, to have access to, to apply positions, but before you become part of this group two, it's called, uh, you need to go through a vetting process, uh, which is the same vetting process that anybody being recruited into UNHCR uh, goes through. Uh, and it, and it, uh, it, you know, they look at the background check, uh, your references and contact them. Uh, and there's also a psychometric uh, test that you have to go through. So it's not automatic, you still have to go through a process. Uh, but you're, you know, you're kind of selected as a group that can become an internal uh, applicant. Uh, the other thing I would also emphasize is that you can um, you can only do this after a year into your assignment. So even though you have the three years, if uh, for for the, for the sake of argument, uh, you had uh, a contract which was um, I don't know, two and a half years, for example, um, and then you're into uh, your second contract, um, uh, you can't actually. Uh, do follow this process until a year of that assignment, that second assignment has gone by. Okay, I don't know if I've explained that uh, clearly, uh, but you, uh, you have to be at least a year into your assignment before you can you can um, uh, go through the talent pool, go through this vetting process, etc. Okay, um, uh, so that that would be one thing. Um, in terms of um, the online uh, career fairs, um, it's not exactly my area, uh, but TOAS do, uh, I know because I've seen TOAS colleagues running off to, to these online career fairs, I know they do participate in them. Um, uh, uh, in fact, now we're in, a, in also a process of evaluating how we're doing recruitment on a worldwide level, because in the past, uh, physical uh, participation in career fairs tended to take place it's only in Europe, and clearly that's not, uh, you know, what we should be doing. Um, so at the moment, they are going through a process of also, um, uh, you know, looking at uh, not only the online career fairs, but also looking at the principal fairs in the continents or in countries, etc. Uh, and there is this idea that we need to attract talent from, uh, you know, because in Europe it might be people from non-Europeans going to these career fairs, but often, of course, it tends to be more European. And you know, we've got the the, the the Europeans I already, so we need to track uh, um, uh, candidates from other places. Uh, what else would I say? Um, in terms of the whole process of the, the talent pool, I mean, everything is channeled through the talent pools. Um, so, you know, to apply to UNHCR, you, you, you basically look at the different talent pools, see the ones that fit your profile. Uh, and that's basically what kicks off this process of uh, vetting. Uh, and once you're fully vetted, uh, then it, it works the same as a roster. So depending on needs, you will be contacted um, uh, saying, look, some, this opportunity has come up. It could be uh, um, a fixed contract uh, position, but it could also be a TA. Um, uh, and so basically they contact you and they say, look, this has come up. Are you, in, are you available? Are you interested? And if you say yes, then your profile is submitted to the, to the manager. Uh, so that's a little bit how they work. Um, and there, there is, if I remember rightly, a, a, a certain period um, uh, that you're in this talent pool. And after that, 
Um, uh, I mean, you get reminders asking people, please reconfirm that you're still part of the talent pool. Please update your profile because, of course, a year might have gone by. So make sure that your profile is updated with whatever additional experience or skills you've developed. Um, uh, but it's it's not like you're in the talent pool for life. Um, uh, you know, at some point they say, okay, if you want to be part of the talent pool, you have to reapply. Rosie, there are some questions specifically for UMV. For so, for example, Balak is asking, how can it be permanent part of UMV? So, uh, uh, UMV is also a, a core uh, a, a core of staff. So, UMV there is UMV staff. As you know, UMV is administered by UNDP. So, effectively, we are UNDP uh, employees. Um, and all the, the jobs uh, are advertised on the UNDP jobs website, uh, and you will find them all there. Uh, and essentially, is a regular process to apply. Uh, like in the case for UNHCR, also in UMB, when you have been a UN volunteer, this is also counted uh, towards uh, uh, your experience, and this is considered favorably uh, compared to other external candidates that uh, do not have the specific UMB expertise. Um, so essentially, it's just a regular uh, uh, job, and all the jobs are advertised on the UNDP website. Um, then I have uh, other questions um, for Rosie, or, well, generic questions on how long before landing a job or expecting to land a job should you start contacting the people. So this is referring back to making the connection uh, internal to the organization. And a second question comes in uh, from Elvis, who's thanking uh, you for the presentation, which was excellent, Rosie, uh, uh, as usual. I often hear people say that it will not cost you anything to apply for a job that you're not qualified for. But do you stand the chance of being invited to fund for the interview? What is your take? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, in terms of how long before, uh, I mean, my theory is that one should be doing this all the time. Um, you know, I think if you're interested in people, developing relations with people should be part of your kind of um, uh, daily activity. I remember one uh, uh, colleague I had in where I used to work before, he used to make a point of meeting somebody. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's true, uh, you know, a university professor, expert in communication uh, and entrepreneurship, etc. But he just used to think it was just interesting to to um, uh, to meet very different people from your own, your own environment because it's a way of really getting to know uh, uh, different things. Uh, you know, we tend to be very focused on our own thing and, and forget that actually there's a whole world out there. Um, but I mean, you know, without going to what Connor used to do, I think it's it's a good idea that you do this type of thing. Uh, you know, at ever every opportunity that you have, as I say in a conference, you could just sit there and listen to the lecturer, or you could really take advantage of the breaks to make sure that you develop a relationship with somebody, uh, etc. Now, when you're in job hunting mode, uh, I would say at least. Uh, I mean, it depends because in the UN system, we take so very long to hire somebody. <laughs> um, you know, in the, in the private sector, it takes on average six weeks to hire somebody. And, and uh, in, in the UN system, it's between, uh, what, well, minimum, minimum four months to, to, to nine months. Um, so from that point of view, I would do it at least six months before, even, even uh, uh, earlier, I would say. Uh, because again, it just takes time to develop that relationship, to contact these people, etc. So I would try and do it. Uh, I mean, the ideal thing is if you're doing it all the time, you don't have to kickstart a, a process. But most of us have never done this. So I would say at least between six and nine months before. If it's you know something within the UN system, uh, if it's more private sector, I would say six months before is is fine. So that was one uh, question, and I think there was another around apply, written down apply here. Uh, oh yeah, whether you should apply to positions that you're not qualified for. Um, personally, I don't think it's worth it. Um, uh, I think you know these systems. I mean, I think it depends. If you're in a market where it's impossible to find people, uh, for example, you know we, we uh, a chat. You know, there's not that many uh, 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 people in chat with a with um, a master's degree. Uh, so in that in that sense, it might you know because you need the master's degree, uh, etc. You might actually be a bit more flexible on somebody not having the background. Um, uh, but 
so in those markets where it's actually very difficult to find somebody, uh, you know, you don't have much of a choice. So you're happy to have somebody rather than nobody at all. But generally speaking, if you don't have the background, I think the best way of getting a job is 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 talking to people. Um, because you know you, you have the you have two types of people people that are very focused on oh unless they have the degree and they have the experience I'm not interested in and then you have managers which are much more visionary uh, and these and these uh, managers are looking for people who can get the job done and they realize that actually learning about uh, you know whatever the subject is might take them six months but it's very difficult to find people with those particular skills. Uh, so, so they're much more willing to take a risk on you because they realize that those trans, they call them transferable skills, you have them very, very strongly. And that actually acquiring knowledge, most people that are intelligent don't take that long to acquire knowledge, uh, but acquiring skills is much more difficult. Um, so if I was looking to get a job uh, uh, in something that I wasn't qualified for, I would go for the networking route. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother applying uh, uh, online. Um, you know, unless, as I say, it's, an, it's a place where, you know, luckily there's no candidate, uh, in which case they might just think, okay, I'd rather interview you and see if you have something to offer, then, then, then stop the process altogether. Thank you, Rosie. And um, then there are some questions on um, whether it is uh, advisable and acceptable for UMB to move from one agency to the other. And I would always recommend that depending also on what, what is uh, your career, let's say, um, expectations, what your career progression is and what your dreams are, uh, to get as much uh, experience as possible also in, in more diverse contexts, because that gives you really uh, an, an understanding on where to go, uh, where you can go uh, and if this is really the job for you, if this is something that you would like to continue pursuing. Uh, so I always recommend, particularly at the beginning of, the, uh, of a career, to explore different avenues to really see what is that suits you best uh, and, and then dedicate yourself to become more specialist in that, in that area. Um, other colleagues are asking also about if they're national volunteers, what is the best course of action, whether to, for example, look for a professional national position in their country or to go abroad as an international volunteer. And this really very much depends on what, again, what your career expectations are. If you want to work in international cooperation and international development, I would always recommend to go abroad, at least for a period of time, even if your long-term um, your long-term plans are to be back in your or country of origin, and this because it gives you a little bit of uh, a breadth of understanding of what international development is about and how to work in also a different context, in a multicultural context. Uh, this is my recommendation, again, when starting out, to also try and understand what is your path. Uh, if you have already a clear understanding that you want to remain in your country uh, and do not want to move, then of course, in terms of career progression, you can look at professional uh, jobs uh, within the uh, NOB, NOA, NOC categories, and and then pursue that 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 kind of expertise. For Rosie, I have another question on the networking and how to, you know, uh, what is the best way to keep in touch, for example, with former uh, line managers and supervisors. Uh, to maintain this network rich and open as you were uh, as you were uh, recommending um, I mean I would say I mean uh, uh, you know I, I've always kept in touch with my uh, previous managers you know from time to time I just send them an email saying hey how are you doing uh, is everything okay or I mean the one thing I love about LinkedIn I have to say is that it kind of follows people um, so you know I get messaging uh, saying that this person has a new job um, so, you know, I take the opportunity to basically congratulate them and say, wow, you know, that's great. Um, and, you know, maybe we've spoken in the past about where, what, where they see themselves. So if it's something that is it's completely in accordance with their objectives, you know, I'll say, wow, you know, fantastic. You've, you know, you've made it, you know, what you said you wanted to do, you've done it. Uh, or if it's a complete change, I'll say, wow, you know, where did this come from? Can you explain? And then again, it gives me an opportunity to, to, to re-engage with them. Um, yeah, I mean, I use LinkedIn a, a lot. Uh, it's, it's, um, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic tool. So, and it's just a very easy way of maintaining your contacts uh, up to date. Um, I think also festive seasons uh, are a nice time to, you know, wish somebody, you know, happy Diwali or <laughs> um, happy Christmas, uh, whatever, just to remind them that you're thinking of them and that you're wishing them all the best. Um, uh, and then if it's something 
uh, I'm just thinking one particular person, you know, we have an area of interest that we both uh, share. So if I see an article around that issue, uh, I'll say, look, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is actually really interesting. Um, so check this out. Um, and, you know, they'll send an email back saying, oh, you know, read it and a comment on it. I don't agree or whatever it is. And so, you know, this is how I maintain a, a basically a relationship with them. Um, but I mean, I've been lucky in that most of the jobs that I've done, I've developed, you know, I guess personal, it's beyond just the professional, you know, it's, it's uh, um, you know, you develop a nice uh, relationship with, so it doesn't feel to me as like professional development, it feels much more like I'm contacting an old friend. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Then we have uh, some colleagues who are simply stating, you know, they have 11 years of experience, 13 years of experience. How do they approach, uh, for example, UNHCR or the UN, the UN rosters? Uh, is this through the research that you were talking about? Uh, where to start, perhaps, is the, is, the, is the right recommendation to give at this stage? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think... Uh, so in terms of applying uh, to the roster, uh, I mean, you, you, to the talent pools, you apply and depending on your background, everybody's in the same pool, but then they're classified, of course, depending on the number. It's not, it's not focused only on attracting P2 or P3. Uh, it goes all the way up to uh, D1. Um, uh, so but the, a little bit of the method of having all these people in one place is, uh, is a talent pool. Um, in terms of how to start developing those relationships. Uh, I mean, it depends what you're doing now, but I mean, if you're working in an operation, I mean, recent, uh, re relatively recently, I was in uh, Dadaab and in the in the in Kenya uh, and in the UN complex. Everybody was there, so you had IOM, you had um, you know all the different UN agencies. Uh, and again, you know, you can decide I'm just going to do my own thing and I'm going to stick to, to people that I'm working with, etc. Or in the socials, you make sure that you meet these people. And so it's just a way of engaging people, you know, from other agencies and again, developing those relationships. You know? um, now, if you don't know them from Adam, uh, I mean, the thing is that the UN system when it comes to things like LinkedIn is still pretty, I would say, I mean, I was surprised by just how many people are on LinkedIn that are UNHCR. Right? I think it's, it, there was actually thousands of people there. Um, but I don't think compared to, for example, the private sector, um, you know, we use LinkedIn, uh, so we, uh, 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 the same as we use Facebook. <laughs> so, so there's much more activity there, if you like. You know, the, the, um, uh, but I do think if people are on LinkedIn, uh, then connecting with them on LinkedIn uh, can be a, a useful way of, of contacting these people. Uh, there may be social groups, um, you know, people that are particularly focused on durable solutions, for example, or, um, uh, you know, people set up groups on, on LinkedIn. Uh, and the good thing about, uh, about it is that once you join the group, uh, you actually have access to all their contact details. So then you're able to, you know, you don't need to have a contact request. You can already contact them directly because you both belong to the same, to the same group. Um, uh, so, uh, and then I think using, if you're working in a particular area functionally or in a sector, uh, people tend to know each other in the sector because, you know, they've been, you know, people that uh, shared experiences in South Sudan, uh, re-met in um, Syria or in Yemen or in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, so, you know, use the people that you know uh, to contact, uh, uh, to give you that bridge to, to contact the people uh, that you don't know. Uh, because maybe you don't know them directly, but they might have actually met somebody that worked for UNHCR, and so that's how they connect you with that person. Thank you, Rosie. I think we're running out of time. There is um, a lot of questions coming in, so I would invite you all to perhaps uh, write uh, to me or write to the in the community of practice of the UMV campus that we created especially for this um, uh, career transition series. Uh, and there we will uh, aim at answering the questions so that they're also visible for all because there is a lot uh, a, a lot of questions asking, you know, for moving assignments, um, how to, you know, specifically enter certain roles and s specific profile questions and so on. So just to conclude in terms of the wrap up, um, my takeaways for these sessions are the fact that we've always done it this way does not necessarily mean it's the right way. So approaching the job market in the right way, understanding what is behind, doing the research uh, is, is the way to go. So to try to be specific, it is a matter of trust and it's also a matter of trying things out. 
um, one other key lesson for me was to manage your expectations. So understanding that this is a, a big numbers game uh, and, and we need to stand out from the crowds. Um, the good uh, takeaway as well out of this is that I understand that you, the UMB experience as a short stint uh, into a, a specific UN agency gives you the opportunity to showcase your skills, to, to showcase your, uh, your, your, your expertise, and it really can give you that um, ahead moment towards the, the, the rest of the candidates. Uh, and having said that, I would like to thank you very much. I would like to thank Rosie. I don't know if Rosie, you have a, you know, a, a one takeaway that you want to share with the colleagues be, uh, before we conclude. Um, I mean, I would say, I guess, if I had to say one thing about this presentation is, you know, people make the world go round. Um, so, you know, develop relationships, give, and you shall receive. Um, I think that's that's basically the the key message uh, of this presentation because that's essentially how people are getting jobs. Uh, 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 is, is through those um, uh, personal contacts. Um, so I'll, I'll be sending Marcia the, the, the presentation because I did some last minute changes, you may have noticed. <laughs> um, so I'll send, I'll send uh, Marcia the, the, the presentation. Um, I mean, I hope you, you found the, the session useful. It's been a real pleasure uh, being with you this afternoon uh, and I wish you all the best in this process and hopefully see you on the next webinars. Thank you again, Rosie. Thank you to you participants. The next session will be in May. At the very beginning of May, we're going to have two. Um, so looking forward to that and look for my email to with the presentation, the recordings and the space on the UMB campus to continue manage your career uh, and help you move forward. Thank you so much and have a good evening, uh, rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yep.